Coming up next on Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. God is totally separate and holy. He is different. He is pure. He is awesome. And he's not one that you want your kids to be casual with. What's the most important thing as a parent that you can give your child? Is it helping them get good grades? Is it they become great in sports? Is it they're happy and well-adjusted? Or are there certain values that if they're implanted in your child's heart that will serve them for the rest of their days? In our last broadcast, we talked about three smooth stones, three values that you want to teach your child that will cause them to be sustainable through the rest of their life, to walk with God and to make a difference. Stone number one, teach them to suffer well. Stone number two, teach them to work into the Lord. And stone number three, teach them to manage their life wisely. We're going to jump right in in this broadcast and talk about stone number four, a value your child's got to have. Stay with me. Todd, uh, I, I believe he was about six years old or maybe seven. Uh, not sure exactly how old he was, but it was about that time. And um, he was always uh, uh, very obedient. Both of my children were always very obedient. But from time to time, they did need discipline. And he had, he had specifically disobeyed something that we had told him not to do. And there wasn't any gray area. It was, it was one of those that, you know, he did it and he knew he did it. And he just, uh, he just did it in spite of everything. So when it uh, was time to receive discipline, I took him upstairs and we sat down on the side of the bed and I just told him, I said, uh, Todd, you've done, you, you know, you've disobeyed, you deserve a punishment. You deserve to uh, have a spanking. And um, he agreed that he did. But I told him, I said, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of you receiving the spanking from me, I won't, I want to take your, I want to take your punishment. Excuse me. And I said, the reason I want to do that is uh, so you will understand just how the Lord took the punishment for us. And, of course, he couldn't do it either. He, he, uh, he couldn't spank me and I couldn't spank him. But we just cried and we hugged each other, and uh, that was uh, that was very important in, in both of our lives. Fourth stone is teach them to make wise choices, not choices that are always popular, but choices that are godly. And for this, I'm going to talk about a theology of holiness. You need to teach your kid early and often that God is high, he is holy, he's totally other. And by holy, don't, don't be thrown off by that word. I don't mean holy as in big black robe, big thick Bible, a frown on your face and they put a praise the Lord sticker on the back of their bike. That is not holiness. <laughs> the word holy literally means other or separate. Uh, for you women, the word holy, you know the regular dishes you use? And then there's the china for what? special occasions, they're other. That's the idea of this word holy. It, it is not mundane, it is not casual, it's not every day. God is totally separate and holy. He is different, he is pure, he is awesome. And he's not one that you want your kids to be casual with. Though he chooses to lower himself to be our friend, he is awesome. And every single person who comes face to face before God falls flat on their face. He is pure and he's to be reverenced. And so we teach our kids that God is high and that he's holy and God is absolute truth. In a world that doesn't know if anything is right or wrong, God is absolute truth and God's word defines absolute truth. And then just before they feel like you've gone into some rigid parental mode, remind them that God's laws are for our Remember, obedience is what? 
the channel through which our children will experience God's blessing. And what, what are the commandments? The commandments or the rules are like guardrails that keep you and me and keep our kids on the highway where when they land, they'll experience the highest and the best from God. When God says commandments to 13 and 15 year old young males after all they're being bombarded with in our culture, sex before marriage is wrong. It is not because God's a prude. And you don't want to come over here and say to your son, son, I know you have all those desires, but God says no. And, you know, then they turn on the TV and they only watch three beer commercials and there's all these gorgeous babes. And, you know, if you drink this kind of beer or smoke this kind of cigarettes or drive that kind of car, all those gorgeous babes just jump in the car with you. Well, what do you think your kid's going to believe? You going, no. <laughs> or MTV going, yeah. Huh? <laughs> what do you think? And so then you sit down with your son and you say, God has given a beautiful, beautiful gift called sex, son. And you're right at that time in your life where I'm telling you, you are drawn to the opposite sex. And you know what, son? That's a good thing. Because God has a time and a place inside certain boundaries where he wants you to experience and express communication at a deep level with one woman for the rest of your life. But you know something? All the stuff you see on the TV and all the commercials, we're going to talk about them even as we're watching the game. They're trying to snicker you and they're trying to fool you and they're trying to seduce you and they're trying to give you a good thing at the wrong time and in the wrong way. God loves you so much that he put borders and boundaries called commands. And he says, no sex before marriage. Because what we found now, the research we know, we didn't know this 30 years ago, that those who have sex before marriage have a higher incident of divorce. We know that if you have sex before marriage, the probability that you'll commit adultery goes up. And, and almost laughable, the research tells us that those who've had sex before marriage will have a lower sexual satisfaction in their marriage. See, God wants something better for you. See, it's a theology of holiness that's winsome, that's good. And then you say, there's consequences, son. Forty years ago, never, no one ever heard of AIDS. Genital herpes never goes away. These sexually transmitted diseases, the psychological pain, are you ready to be a father and take on that responsibility? But it's not a harsh, get with it. You're teaching them a theology of wholeness that a good God who's sovereign and loves them has put certain boundaries down for their benefit. You get it? That's what you teach them. And a theology of holiness says God's ultimate aim is to make them holy, not always happy. You can have joy, but you won't always be happy. That means that your sensual impulses might just lie to you, and they may not be good for you at all. And what, quote, feels good and you ought to just do it might be the very worst thing that you ever do. The Old Testament roots are Exodus 3, where when God gives his name, I am that I am, Yahweh. Do you remember what he says to Moses? Moses, the ground that you're on is holy. What, what's he do? Take off your shoes. When God's revealing his name, he tells him, holy, that's who I am. When Isaiah Isaiah 6 goes into the temple. We hear, what are the cherubim and the seraphim? What are they singing? Holy, holy, holy. Now, in Hebrew, when you want to make a point, you repeat the word. It's not God is very, 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 very holy. Holy, holy, holy. It's the only word in any description of God anywhere in the Bible that's repeated three times. It's for emphasis. We find it also in Revelation chapter 5. The New Testament roots are in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, where it's just flat, straight out clear. You shall be holy because I am holy, right? And so the application of parents is help your child learn to discern between good and evil. That's really what holiness is all about. Help your child learn to discern between good and evil. Well, how do you do that? Let me give you a few practical pointers. One, start when they're little. Start when they're little and read to them. Give them the Bible stories. Give them a great balance of God's love and God's holiness. Give them, give them lots of pictures and stories about good decisions that lead to God's blessing and bad decisions that leads to a lot of pain in people's lives. And one of the greatest evidences that this book was written by God and not by men is that if a man wrote this book, we would not include all the stories of all the failures. There's a lot of people that don't come out shining very well in this one, right? It's very self-revealing. 
So start very young. Second, read to them. Read to them, read to them, read to them, and then after that, read to them. Expose them to the truth. Um, the teenage years, I had my kids read Personal Holiness in Times of Temptation. Um, I, with one son, we went through all the major Bible themes with Schaefer and Sperry, where uh, we literally did Bible studies together. Um, I exposed them to people that lived holy lives. And a missionary, a pastor, a godly layman, when I could smell someone who really walked with God, I'm buying dinner and I'd have all the kids come with me. And we still have stories about sitting around a table and hearing from Tom Randall, a missionary in the Philippines, or Walt Baker, a professor at Dallas, or John Hanna, a history professor, or, you know, uh, Jim, who was one of the lay people that was uh, just a godly, godly man at a tiny little church in Texas. I just exposed my kids to holy people. Not weird holy, righteously holy. Um, I would encourage you to, uh, and this is probably the most important practical tip is uh, if you allow the current media to shape your child's life, you have no hope of raising a holy child. And you'll need to be very radical. As I shared, in our home, Monday through Thursday and on Sunday night, the TV wasn't turned on. Uh, you need to monitor how much time they're on the Internet you need to monitor what they hear, what they listen to, what the music is, what the words are. And, and you, need, you need to be on top of that because you, you're not going to take them to church for 45 minutes or an hour and have a little family devotion, if you're a great family, a couple, three times a year and have them listening to Marilyn Manson about killing people and watching four hours of MTV and five movies this week and even watch the normal diet that's on prime time that all are telling them the exact opposite in very tantalizing, appealing ways of everything you're trying to teach them. And if you don't lay your foot down and be really, really strong about this is the video that's allowed in our house, this is the time that we'll give to allowing that kind of input in our brain, you will find yourself scratching your head in about 10 or 15 years saying, I wonder what went wrong. Now let's see, we poured five million hours of this content in and about five and a half hours of this content, and I just can't figure out why they're not buying this and they're going with this. This is the unpopular one, and this is one where your kids will try you on, and they'll say all the other kids and all the other Christian parents let their kids do, and here's the line. I'm going to give it to you, parents. Are you ready? When you get this one, are you ready? This is worth the entire time. What you say to them is, I understand all the other Christian parents may be doing it, but I love you more than their parents love them. <laughs> Does that work or not? Huh? And they say, oh, blah, blah. no, 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 I love you. And in 10 years, you can tell me how bad I've been, but I guess I just must love you because I know this isn't good for you. And by the way, do you want to go over that passage about what? No, nah, Dad, I understand. Forget <laughs> it, right? When you begin to think about parenting as specific goals and truths that you want to impart, now you begin to see how to apply them. It's not about just doing a list of things. It's about creating a set of values inside the child's heart. So when they start thinking that I want to be holy, life message here, this is crucial. This is what you want your kids to think. Holy living allows you to experience God's best for your life. Holy living allows you to experience God's best for your life. It's not a prohibition. I'm not keeping something good from you. I spent, I think, the first five years of my Christian life feeling like I'm on this side of the fence, and God is on this side of the fence. And, you know, I didn't grow up as a Christian. I never read the, I never read the New Testament or anything. And, you know, I just was, I was willing to negotiate with him. I was saying, God, I'll tell you what, I'll do eight out of the ten of the commands. <laughs> you know, what do you think? I mean, that's pretty good. I wasn't doing but two or three before I met you. So I'll do eight out of ten, but there's two I don't want to do. And, you know, God was on this other side going, no, Chip, all ten, you must keep, you know. And you know what I didn't know? I had no idea that really I was over here and God was behind me with his arm around me. And he said, I just love you too much. You're just so naive and stupid, Ingram. He said, those two ones that you would break, he said, that'll send you down a trail that'll bring heartbreak heartbreak and pain for the rest of your life.